Welcome to the Octavius Gould Experience, and I am your host, Octavius Gould. I have the pleasure to welcome here today as a guest, Benito Rezer. How are you doing today, Benito? I am doing fabulous. Super excited. Well, I am excited to have you on here, and let me just give my audience a taste into your impressive background. <laughs> Manito is the founder and CEO of Manito HR Solutions, LLC. She has over a decade of experience in human resources. She's based in the Motor City, that is Detroit, Michigan, for some of you all who may not know. <laughs> uh, she has a strong background in succession planning, re recruitment strategies, workforce development, quality improvement, and organizational development, along with many more uh, areas of expertise. And one of the things that really impressed me, Manito, when I was looking at your background is the fact that you talk about uh, how you believe in customer growth and satisfaction by leveraging team engagement with the goal of producing desired results, because it's all about the customer experience, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for joining me. Again, I am so honored to have you on. The first question I have for you, Manito, is what inspired you to become an entrepreneur? I am an advocate by heart. Um, I believe in the people. I'm very people oriented. And uh, working out of corporate America, I didn't realize we have all the bells and whistles until you start working for a smaller organization. And I just had this strong desire, even though I love what I was doing in human resources, organizational development, just as cool to feel like I wanted to have more of an impact in the community. So I started mentoring young girls and women, but I kept getting pulled into, hey, I know you worked in HR. Can you help me with this? So I uh, went back to a smaller organization, about 100 people. And when I became an HR director, I was like, oh, wow, there are some a lot of things a lot of compliance issues, a lot of um, leadership gaps that I identified. And I say, this is a perfect opportunity to use what I love doing um, and really help support employers and the employees. Awesome. What challenges did you face initially becoming an entrepreneur that you had to overcome? Everything, all of them. <laughs> so I think the number one challenge is thinking that you have to do everything all at one time because sometimes when you're looking at social media if you're hearing other people's success stories and even their barriers it's overwhelming so I was the the number one thing I just kept saying instead of trying to hurry up and get the social media and all of the the website and all of these tools and resources let me go in and start with the heart start why I'm doing this first and that really helped me to like okay I'm not trying to the pace of competitors or trying to make this about my business. I wanted to do this because again, going back to I'm an advocate. So starting with that why, where we always talk about, that really helped me to pace myself and to really enjoy the process. And over time, you just keep adding on those layers. What advice would you give someone who's aspiring to become an entrepreneur? You talked about some of the roadblocks that we all face as entrepreneur, entrepreneurs initially. What advice would you give someone who's aspiring to become an entrepreneur that will help them get off the ground and get started at a quicker pace? And I just heard this video from Marie Forleo, and she's a like an influencer in helping small businesses. One of the things that really honed in and it resonated with me um, because you can go to a smaller business association. Those are all the critical things, too. Mm -hmm. But the people that I found that really have longevity and really stay in it when it gets in the thick of things, when you're kind of over the honeymoon stage of, oh, my God, I started a small business. If you don't understand why you are doing this, if you don't have your own compelling story that you connect with, not the story and the branding that they tell you to have ready on a piece of paper. Like when you're asking me this, I can give you tons of stories that I encounter as an employee that I encounter working in leadership, um, some of the discrepancies and, and the pitfalls. If you don't have that connection connection of your why, like why am I doing this when I get frustrated? Why am I doing this when, when it's being successful? You're gonna give up and you're gonna start something else and you're gonna say well, something's better. 
So one of the things she stated that when she started making money, but she was overwhelmed and exhausted, she said, I wanted to add value and impact. Mm -hmm. And I want to do something that gives me joy and energy. Because I'm Six Sigma certified. And one of the things they talk about is inefficiencies. They're talking about productivity, cost, safety, quality. That's critical too. You need all that. But again, value and impact. So I always think about how am I adding value and impact? That's going to spark creativity, innovation. And then joy and energy is something that you love from the heart. Like I enjoy seeing people say, thank you so much. Or when they're frustrated or they trust me, that means everything. So the money will come and then you do your small business association. Then you go and say, hey, I need a mentor. You want to put your name out there. You want to tell people what you're doing. You'll find that most people want to help you. Awesome. You, you talked about the money will come. And so many entrepreneurs and even myself, we sometimes focus so much on revenue generation. I always call it, you know, RGA, revenue generating activity. And I try to focus more on that at the beginning of my entrepreneurial endeavor. And then I had to realize that there were so many other things that were more important. And if I focused on that, the money would follow. What, in your opinion, is important for people to focus on initially outside of the money? Is it really building your brand, building your credibility, influence? What would be some of those important steps that people should focus on outside of trying to bring in that revenue initially? Yes, you cannot compartmentalize who you are just as much as employers attract the types of employees that they bring into the organization. So when you're going and thinking about whether you're working for an organization or past organizations you worked for, when you went into a place or any um, business trying support, what do you want to connect with? Usually you love people. If you look on like Yelp or some of the reviews, no one greeted me. No one talked to me. Oh my God, this person was so rude. Right. They didn't talk about the ambiance first. Sometimes they do. They always talk about the person. How do they make me feel? And if you are the type of person who like you have a competitive spirit, um, maybe you like to work more in silos, you're not a big picture, or maybe you are, it's important to dig in to self-awareness because how you show up, I don't care what you put on a piece of paper, I don't care what they tell you to do, how you genuinely show up is what they're going to see. So self-awareness is critical. There are tons of assessments to get an idea. I, um, um, I facilitate Gala Strengths Finder. And I'm okay. like, yeah, that resonates with me, how I connect, how I operate, how I work. Um, what inspires me? Some people like early morning person, some people are not. You have to know that because it's going to impact every decision and how you make decisions for the long run. That is number one. And people don't talk about that enough. Right. Because the minute I start having a conversation with a prospect or I could send a beautiful proposal, mm -hmm. the minute they talk to you, they can already tell if you um, uh, disingenuous. You know, they could tell people like we know this, right? We we've been through this enough. And he's like, you could tell when somebody just wants your money. Right. You could tell when they really don't care. I have told people no. Like they say, can you do this training? I said, I don't put band-aids <laughs> <laughs> on a on operational wounds. You know, so that's the kind of stuff when they kind of take back, because I could take your money, but but being very sincere of who you are is going to be critical, critical. So self-awareness. I can't exactly. express that. And that's what probably helps you build those long-term relationships versus, mm -hmm. you know, the one hit wonders that we find in many situations in entrepreneur in the entrepreneurial world, correct? Yes. It's critical. I have some clients that call me sis, family, <laughs> love you. <laughs> but that's just because that's my personality type. So you're going to attract certain energies. And even if I have um I have some clients who are all about the bottom line and want to get straight to business, but I know how to operate with that too. You know, we start with the right. small talk and long as that you understand and that start with self-awareness, paying attention to not just how you show up, but how others show up. So if you know someone who likes the bottom line, like to speak and get to the point, know who you are, then you can pay attention to know what other people needs are. That is awesome. 
So you graduated with a bachelor's in business leadership from Baker College in Auburn Hills. And that's actually where the NBA team plays, if I'm correct, correct? It's, yeah, don't test me on my sports skills. <laughs> <laughs> the number, the number one thing is honesty, so and integrity. <laughs> don't test me on that. I, lo I love that. I love that. I love that. <laughs> from, from your perspective, when you think back to your college days, how are those relationships that you formed on campus or that experience helping you today as an entrepreneur? Um, I still keep in touch with some of people that we went to school with. But what I will tell you, by the time I graduated, the information has changed. It's mm -hmm. so certain <laughs> business leadership, <laughs> there are principles and foundation, yes. But mm -hmm. as you know, it's so it moves quickly and it's uh, we have access a lot more to information. So all that to say, yes, I have relationships with the people, but and it helped. But you will find a lot of people who went to college have still created it's still a learning. It's not a segregation like, OK, once that ended, now you want to go integrated and intersectional. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if they answer the question, but it's like. It's continuous, like the learning continue, because once I got that, I was like, wow, all of this seems um, antiquated. <laughs> I, I am with you, I, because it's interesting when I think back to my college career, you know, I find that there's so many things that I learned today on Google or mm -hmm. looking at a blog or someone's post on LinkedIn that I wish they would have showed or educated me on um, in college. And I think what I pull most from my experience are the relationships that I develop on campus mm -hmm. that I engage today. Many, many of the people that I engage through LinkedIn, I met decades ago. I, I don't want to date myself, but I met yeah. decades ago at the University of Florida or at the University, University of Minnesota. And it just goes back to show how important relationships are, regardless Absolutely. of where you develop those relationships. But developing and maintaining those relationships. So with that being said, Manito, talk to me about the relationship aspect of being an entrepreneur and owner of your business, especially in the HR consultancy space. You hit it dead on because when I left corporate and I was like telling some close colleagues and now they're friends, um, what I wanted to do if you are a person that they can trust, or if you're a person who um, stand behind your name, your integrity, all that matters. You, it, they remember everything. Yeah. So if they believe in you and they they can uh, attest to the work that you have done, a lot of people are like, let me introduce you to someone. Mm -hmm. um, I think you should go here. It is so much easier than going into a room of strangers because now you have to sell yourself, your brand, and get out there. But it was um, in my beginning of my journey, I spoke to a girlfriend and we were in a bathroom and she said, I think you should do it. It was a real conversation. I was like, I do not want to do this anymore. And she was like, I think you should do it. And she said, I have somebody that I want you to meet. It was one of her stores. And I met one. She said, I cannot pay you, but I'm going to give you opportunity to check people in. And you got access to all the movers and shakers in the city. And I took full advantage. I was she was like, you can go into breakout rooms. That was more than getting paid because I was like, hi, my name is, and this is what I do. I heard what you're doing. I'm inspired by what you said. And they love that people lean in because they they appreciate that you're paying attention. Um, and then it would just, just take one. And once I had that one, then it just kept branching out and you build those, like you said, genuine relationships and going back to the self-awareness because Octavius, how you're asking me questions, you're going to get that all the time. So right. tell me, why, why are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they want to know your your story. Like, can I connect to that? Who are the people that will story? Because I have heard people's stories and I'm like, hey, what do you really want to do this for? And then some people say, right. I don't even want to make money. I don't want to work for nobody. You know, it's coming from a place. I'm just over it. Always but the money, right? It's always the money. I was like, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to have a rough time. Yes. You're going to have a rough time. Because you ain't going to make no money in the Friday, the first year. Not how much you think you're going to make. Exactly. Maybe, and with that being not. said, I was looking at your website and you are truly certified. So you're certified in Myers-Briggs, Gallup Strengths Finder, 
conversations, uh, accountability and com conversations, and then Stephen Covey's leading at the speed tr trust. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about some of these certifications and how they have helped you build influence within your industry. Oh my gosh. So I got those um, through corporate. Okay. And that's the plus side of working through a corporate organization and have the money to sure. help, right? <laughs> and um, so that's why when I saw the disadvantage and the gap with smaller organizations, they were like, oh, my budget doesn't you know, support that. But how it helped me and even helping me today, it all of them consistently talk about self-awareness. Awareness. Um, each of those leaders talk about the pitfalls of intersectional relationships. So how we sometimes compartmentalize those relationships, like impacting the home, impacting employees, impacting when you become a leader, mm -hmm. um, paying attention to not just what you want to do at the bottom line, like who are you trying to engage and why does that matter? The impact of how it um, impacts cost, productivity. And I was like, yeah, I, I can see that. I can see that because I remember, and we all can attest to this, um, one of those strong leaders who's so inspired and they're so patient and they're teachers and they're influencers and they make it to the top and they always leave you like, take me with you, right? Mm -hmm. And then I have those leaders now like they know what they're doing, but they cut people, they're abrupt, um, they're disengaged. I don't care how smart and savvy you are and what your background is to the table. It was so much turnover and that's a cost. And you and I were talking about some old Sherm data where it costs like $4,425 per person to hire someone. Right. So those things really helped. And I remember one leader said, you know, I've never been a manager before and you need to get in the room and listen to some of the problems that they're having. And she said, because it's great that you're a great facilitator and you got a survey saying you know how to read a script and you know how to engage people. She said, well, I need you to know how to use it. So I started sitting in a room and it was the consistent message. This person um, doesn't take accountability or um, I'm a new leader. It's a lot that we have to meet on a table and people are complaining to me saying they're overwhelmed with work. So being able to connect those skills and ask questions was critical um, and talk about strategies, what's been tried and true and using data to see if there's movement. So all of those pieces, they really do help. So self-awareness, how you show up. Because uh, I like, I have plenty of leaders. I'll like, you the self-awareness is real low. <laughs> oh, I know like, we don't do that, you know, or somebody forcing something. So right. uh, it all helps. Yeah, the higher they climb up the corporate ladder, sometimes the lower that self-awareness becomes. Yes. So with your organization, Manito HR Solutions, you all provide many great services that are truly needed. And when we had our initial conversation, I talked to you about some of the clients that I work with, but even some of the organizations that I come across in my business endeavors, whether it be networking events or just talking to other professionals. And there's so many organizations who think they could just throw anyone into HR. You know, this the sales leader like myself one day may walk, wake up and they're now handling HR or the, the IT person. So Manito, one of the things that I notice as an entrepreneur, but even when I was in corporate America, I would come across so many organizations that did not have an HR infrastructure instead of having a dedicated chief HR officer or an HR manager or what have you, they had someone in another department filling that role, whether it was the IT director or the office manager. What has your experience been with that particular situation? And I assume that's helped you build your business because you were able to provide a solution for these type of organizations. So if you could talk to me about that, I think my audience would really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm going to go back to your original question when you talked about what should an entrepreneur an entrepreneur know when they first start. And we're thinking about the infrastructure. We're thinking about finance, you know, our financials. That's critical. So when we're not really thinking about scalability, we know it's going to happen. But the first people we tend to hire is our friends or um family members. And because we're just trying to find a way to have a sustainable business. But over time, 
you start seeing that now I have to play dual roles because I may have to hire strangers or there are issues with the people that I'm working with, I don't regardless of friends and family. So when I was looking up on SHRM data, I was, re you know, when you were setting this up and I said, wow, 61,000 cases with EEOC and the number one is retaliation because we just don't know. If I never worked in HR, I'm thinking like the first thing I need to have is an employee handbook, okay, and maybe give you an offer letter. If I know that, I may just say, let me get you started and then I'll pay you. But these things start to slowly break down your company because I may not have read the employee handbook. There are some things that I cannot do that may fall under discrimination and it becomes, a, it impedes your cost of the business. So Sherm had stated that it costs 4,425,000 to hire one person. That's by the time I post a position, recruits, you know, have to interview, and hope that someone doesn't ghost me, especially in the service industry. So now, not only I'm playing HR, I got to fill in the gap because I can't hire, I'm not hiring the right people. They don't have the right skills. I'm not um, putting in an um, adequate training. And this is all related under the HR umbrella. So okay. it's super critical because then it starts <laughs> chipping away and I'm not focused on what I do best. Now I'm focusing heavily on and uh, people-related issues. Exactly. And what is SHRM? Uh, I know, but for the benefits of my audience, what is SHRM? And should someone who is looking to get into the HR space get a membership with SHRM? Not necessarily. And I was looking it up because I'm with the Society of Human Resources Management. Yes. Is that the... Okay. Yes. Yep, Society for Human Resources Management. So... You don't necessarily have to become a member, but they have, if you go on their website, I think it's like $200 to okay. um, join just to get access to some tools and resources. So for example, you may look up and say, hey, I just need the employee handbook, like a toolkit, or what should I say? Or what should I not say? But what I have found, if you do that, you're going to find an employer and say, I don't have time to research and look up and run a business to do all of those things. So they may Google something or they may ask somebody, hey, do you know where I can find that? Because then they're juggling because they, well, I don't even know where to start. How do I do that? You know, unless you kind of already in that field. So okay. I would suggest um, if you're not working with a consultant, go to your small business association. There are a lot of tools and resources. They'll help you with marketing and some basic HR just to get you started. Okay. And of course, you can contact me if you know I work across all states, but um, but I do work with small to mid-sized businesses because those are the ones who need it the most. And they were like, where do I start? I'm overwhelmed. Just what is the basic things I should need? And that's how I can support them. OK. And you mentioned earlier the EEOC. Mm -hmm. And that's a bad word to a lot of folks in the HR uh, world, because, you know, if the EEOC is contacting you, it could potentially mean trouble. Yeah. For an HR organization or any anyone within that industry, should they be really familiar with the EEOC and the various regulations that are on a state level? Absolutely. This is in your employee handbook. So when you get the template, um, you're going to find that most of the, the federal is going to be the same. Okay. okay. Then there are state uh, regulations that you must follow. So I have clients in Pittsburgh that's maybe different than Michigan. And right. if you don't know that, you know, being able to go to the Department of Labor and look up all that information, this is where it becomes overwhelming because then they say, where do I start? But the employee handbook will have the basic language about here are some things that the EEOC, which is the Equal Employment Officer Commission, like that, um, will say, here's the guidelines. You can't discriminate because of sex age, gender, race, um, here's this and X, Y, Z. Okay. That is critical, including classification, you know, non-exempt and exempt, but hourly paid person versus salary. Um, because if you misclassify someone and you make them a title, say, hey, I'll make you a manager, but I'm paying you hourly. And there's a certain amount of money they must make per week to be able to be under exempt status. They got three bullets. You got to meet all these qualifications. I don't know that. Okay. You will owe money if the employee decides to say, I don't think I'm being paid fairly or I haven't been paid. I am hourly, you're not paying me overtime. 
So these are the little hookups that can cost the organization a lot of money because you just didn't know. And as an executive coach, I like to stay in my lane, but I do come across <laughs> different professionals at times. Yeah. And as I am engaging them and talking about their business and trying to ascertain how I can assist them, I'll talk about independent contractors versus direct hired employees. Yep. And I am amazed by the number of business owners, small and medium sized business owners who will bring on employees as independent contractors, but manage them like they're full time employees, which I yes. know is one of the problems that organizations run into as it relates to the EEOC. Do you come across that often? That's like probably 90 percent. So the the reason why you will find smaller organizations say I'm going to put you as an independent contractor, because if I hire you as an employee, there are employee taxes I have to pay. So I would rather just make you an independent contractor. But the problem is, I want if you're listening to this, I want you to go to irs.gov and say independent contractor versus um, a contractual employee. Right. OK, so there are you can you can have an employee contractor. Like if I worked at a temp agency, I'm still an employee as a contractor and they okay. would get that confused. There are 20 questions that the IRS is going to look for to identify if you are a true independent contractor. And most of them are people who have a business of their own, business to business relationship. That's probably the safest way. Okay. Um, and if not, then they're for at just at the highest level. So you understand if I'm hiring a person who does not have a business and I wanted you to be an independent contractor, I may give you a project and say, this is when it's due, but you're responsible for your own tools and resources. I don't tell you to come in at nine o'clock and I check with you in five, you don't have a lunch break because the minute I start to treat you as an employee, that's one of the 20 questions that they would ding you if you're okay. audited. <laughs> so I was in to encourage you to go to IRS, just type in independent contractor versus employee and they're gonna give you summer contractors, um, contractual employees because they're still employees. Okay. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I see, I see that so often. And it's a scary situation because it not only jeopardizes the organization, but mm -hmm. it puts the employee in a tough spot too. You take a role as an independent contractor and you may need that opportunity or the money, but yeah. you find yourself being managed as a full-time employee. You know it's wrong, it's unethical, but at the same time, a lot of these independent contractors don't know how to handle that situation appropriately or address it, but more importantly, they don't know their rights. So um, there it is. Yes. And the employer may not know, because like you said, they wear multiple hats. I never worked at HR. So how would I know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That leads me into your organization, Benito HR Solutions. You all do so many incredible things from consulting, compensation analysis, employee relations, I went on your website, IT Solutions, in which I know from our previous conversation, you actually brought on as a service to add more value. So talk to me yeah. about Manito HR Solutions. And for those who are either watching on YouTube or listening on one of their preferred apps, what it is that you all do and how you can help organizations in various ways. Yes. Yeah, so every like the questions that you're asking, that's where I found the need and why yeah. I'm such an advocate, why I wanted to help. So I found that if um, if you're a startup business and they'll say, I just I'm about to hire someone. What do I need to have so we can support you with the basics and the foundation, giving you your handbook, um, setting you up with your file management system? That's critical. If you ever okay. audit it, compliance flyers, job descriptions and classifications that we talked about that can get you in trouble. OK. Um, and then we also have more, I would say, complex, like when you have more employees. Where do we do all things HR except for um, payroll and benefits where we work with a third party to support you? Okay. And how we really differentiate ourselves is that we are all in. So it's like having your own HR, you know, we're at, we're treating you as if we're your, you know, your only HR person that working for you because we want to tailor our solutions really about what you need. We're not just pushing product. I'm tailoring it around, like I'm hearing your pain points. I'm hearing where you're stuck. Um, and then we added like the strategic part in IT because a lot of times 
when we're looking at HR, once you build that infrastructure mm -hmm. um, and we're bringing on people and we're establishing the culture and we want sustainability, we want to grow. This is when you really want to integrate HR into your organizational vision. What are the goals and how do I help support you cascade that message to your staff? So we can have performance management strategies, like making sure everybody have clear goals, they have the tools and resources. How do we measure that success? And the reason why I bought on IT is because we found that, and I was doing this too, like when you have IT, I'm bringing in, putting information on a Google Drive. Right. It's in the cloud, but the more employees you have, and we have social security numbers, if you're onboarding people, that's at risk. And we want to keep you compliant and making sure that no one is taking data from you. Um, that's, you know, that can infringe upon your intellectual property. So we do all of those things from startup to um, mid-sized businesses. That is awesome. And this is done in a software as a service type of environment? Yeah. So um, I have someone who just focuses on the IT. We will look at your current services so we can... Um, move or migrate the Google software into like a Microsoft. So you can have like a shared drive and we can um, create like a LAN connector from your computer. So if you have three or four employees, we can have a login that's just centralized to your business. So no matter where they are, they're not being tapped in by scammers or people that can take your information. And you don't really think about that, but I'm like, all of your stuff is on there, like EIN numbers, social security numbers, that's at risk if you keep it on a Google Drive. And that's why I wanted to help um, organizations outside of the HR because it's integrated. And that's compliance. Manito, that's really important because even as a leadership development consultant, I was engaging a new organization. It was a Fortune 1000 company. And they truly wanted to know about my data management and my infrastructure as it related to managing their employees' email addresses. And I was thinking yes. to myself, well, I'm only managing the email addresses of your employees. That's all I have. But that yeah. was critical to them. And I had to peel back the onion and make sure that I had an infrastructure in place to manage those email addresses. Because we think email address, everyone has it. But to the organization and to their employees, yeah, maintaining and protecting their email address is really critical, right? Yes, absolutely. I'm glad you talked about that. It's just, I don't know if you've seen the latest of the news. It's like we have balloons flying over our state. It's a lot of people that's just like, you never know what they're tapping into. Um, we have government officials are afraid to use TikTok. So all of that is critical. And if I have an employee who's logging on and maybe um, just searching something on Google, on you, you know, you using the company software now. I may have spamware on there, so it's all this risk that can impede the bottom line, which is your cost and productivity. I now have to stop what I'm doing to focus on that. <laughs> and like what you were doing, you were like, oh, just emails. But now it's you have to stop, get this set up, which I'm glad that you did. But it's a cost and it's time. But if you don't do it, it can impact your company um, for long term. Exactly. And let's go to the onboarding and the offboarding piece because I know. As a former VP of sales in corporate America, how important it is to onboard employees appropriately. Yes. Many organizations don't do it. And mm -hmm. then even the offboarding piece, how much intel you can find out about your culture, whether or not it was conducive to success and things of that nature. How are you finding that service that you offer to be beneficial to your clients? Yeah. So when I was talking about when we support them with the organizational goals and the vision, that's critical because I need to understand what's the vision and mission, what are those clear strategies we put it in place because that's gonna be cascaded down to certain members of your team. Mm -hmm. And if that's, if you have a department or if you have a few people on your staff and say, okay, um, three people are responsible for quality in our service and our finances, we need to make sure they have the tools and resources that they need. They need to understand what um, what is the end goal? Like what does success look like by the year end? Yeah. And, and what am I responsible to do? So that's bigger than a job description. Like here's a job description, sign some paperwork and we are compliant. That's the start. Mm -hmm. So onboarding is once we have that, I want to create a story and let them understand your story. So they need to understand the mission and making sure that they align to the culture. Cause that's the number one thing that people ask. What's the culture there? Yes. 
And then we need to understand, um, every employee should understand the organizational goals because it's all hands on deck. It should not be compartmentalized. Because when I talk to employees, they don't really understand how they contribute to the success of your organization. They just see a mission statement and have no idea that their role really does contribute to that success. And they need to know that. That needs to be incorporated in your onboarding branding versus presentation. Here's our story. Here's our information about the CEO, not just info, but the why. Uh, put some cool, savvy videos in, and then you get to the paperwork. Onboarding also entails a continuous learning. Their first 90 days need to be training, hands on, or at least have a clear vision of this is what's going to happen. You're going to meet these people. I'm going to sit with you and talk about um, how you're going to get trained on this. When you're going to make sure you're going to have access to an email. Here's the keys. So I feel like I should be ready to go. I should not be saying, I'm sorry, I don't have, what's the number to this? Or who should I call about this? It stops. It's like, stop, go, stop, go. And it's uncomfortable for them because they don't know who to talk to. So that first 90 days should be a full experience. And then you should have touch points. You should do interviews before somebody even thinking about quitting. So we usually do exit interviews, but you should do stay interviews. Why are you staying? We need to know that. Yes. <laughs> what's Yes. important because I don't want to lose a great employee. It's a cost. So boarding um, is just when a person decides to resign or is terminated. Making sure you have that same checklist. When I say I have gave you access to credit card keys, phone numbers, when they leave, you pull that sheet and they should be ready to say, this is all my stuff I'm collecting. Because you forget. <laughs> I don't know who they got access for. I have no idea. Right. So Manito, with with some of the services that you offer that stuck out to me and struck me as something that I definitely wanted to talk about, organizational development and training. Yeah. Why is that overly important that companies focus and commit to developing their employee population? And how is it that Manito HR solutions can help? Yes. So going back to that organizational vision, that's critical, having a clear strategy, because then we need to position our leaders for success. So if we have direct reports, um, how do I communicate that? How do I ensure that we are staying focused on what we are expected to do? Because once you start getting in the day-to-day -day operations, we start to veer away from department goals, our organizational goals, and we get inundated in the weeds. And we don't know how to say, let me make sure that everyone is clear about what our priorities are because you're gonna get employees. So I'm overwhelmed, we got a lot on our plate. And you should be positioned to say, how do I streamline and say, these are the priorities. If we do this, if we do these things, that's success. Right. Um, so that's important to leadership development. And then positioning leaders of how to talk to people when they get frustrated or when employees need to be held accountable and you still want to keep them engaged and to be able to have dialogue without getting so frustrated and then someone's walking away and you just feel like I'm depleted. Um, the tools and resources, are, we need to make sure that our, our leaders should be positioned for success to help the employees to say, this is proper training. And how do I really help train my staff appropriately because we're trying to stay focused on our organizational goals and what I'm here to do and keep them motivated and engaged. So all of those, the training is the crucial part it, because it impact culture. Because a lot of times when I talk to leaders of any organization, the CEO can have a really great vision, but then there's a disconnect with the managers about, okay, you heard what they need. How do you take this information and make sure that not only you got what you need, because now you got to cascade and, and bring the troops together and rah-rah them on and keep them focused and right. help them along. So we train them to say, okay, do you know how to project man manage? Do you know about time management? Do you know how to do conflict uh, management? What about coaching for success? How frequently are you meeting with each employee? They should not just be looking at a um, biannual performance doctor say that you do this. There should be frequent conversations. How inclusive is the culture? Do you recognize that I may be part of um, the LGBTQ, do you are how well informed? I'm they be part of a different generation. We got millennial generation Z. Do you know how to work with different generations that may see things differently than you? Those are all critical. That needs to be a continuous 
part of the organizational goal, embedding culture, embedding training. So we're getting better. You're not going to do everything overnight, but it should be right. a continuity of to help you with success. I absolutely love that. And one of the things that you touched on, you touched on so many great things that I think will help my audience meeting with employees on a regular, consistent basis. I know when I was a VP of sales, I used to have one-on-ones weekly with my team members. And if I didn't have much to say, I made sure that I didn't meet with them so that it was a very compelling, great use of their time. And I prepared in advance for those meetings. And I yes. find that so many leaders, they feel forced to have one-on-ones because the CEO or an executive leader said, you need to meet with your folks to ascertain why they're not why they not doing this or why they, they're mm -hmm. not doing that. But I find that the leaders who are focused on coaching and development and being more coach-like, they do it because they want to help people yes. progress within their career. So when you're engaging your clients and you're talking about the importance of coaching and development and meeting with their team members, how often do you recommend that leaders do so? Weekly basis, monthly, quarterly, what do you see is most effective? And I know it, it, it varies based on environment and the situation. Yeah, and you hit it on the nose. So if, um, if it's a smaller group, I always say you want to meet, if you have one or two people, at least weekly to have touch points to say, what are our priorities for the week? That's critical. Because if you don't do that, you'll find that I'm, I'm, an employee may get so inundated and we just say, oh, I got so many emails or I have to respond to so many calls. But if we focus on what are our priorities for the week, we can say what's working, what's not working. Uh, let's talk about our successes. You'll be surprised they'll help people to stay engaged like we're a team. I'm not just working alone. You're not just checking on me to make sure I'm, I'm doing something right or doing something wrong. Then based on the number of employees, I will say you want to do at least biweekly or monthly check-ins, depending on how large the group is. Okay. Um, because these are your performance goals. You have your department goals, and then there are goals that's just assigned to you. And they should all be intersectional from organizational, department, and then cascade to that employee. And I'm meeting with you. And what I do help with them, I give you a list of questions because some people are like, what are those starter questions? Right. You should have a list of questions that's consistent to say, how are things going? What's the priorities for a week? Where are you stuck? How can I support you? And some questions if you need to coach them for success without being punitive. Now, there are times you have to get to that point, but you'll be surprised. A lot of people just want to go to, I'm going to talk to you when you're not doing anything right. But touch points, you have the tools and resources. Um, how how do what you call them go? Give them praises. Right. Don't just give me praises at year end. <laughs> Don't give me any surprises <laughs> at year end to say what you didn't do. They hate that. We hated yes. that, right? Yes. So as long as you uh, that should be embedded in the culture. And if it's not naturally organically embedded in the culture, you're gonna be right. You have employees saying, here we go with this checklist, so you can just make sure we're hitting these points. So it needs to be organic. You need to want to and keep that weekly focus on what's our priorities for week? What's some wins today? Yes. Where are we stuck? What's working? What's not working? Because then you have dialogue and then we shouldn't be waiting into those one-on-ones to say, what happened? Why you didn't tell me this earlier? You know, we should be bringing it up collectively as a team. And then when we get to the one-on-one, it's all focused on you. Great insight. I know when I was a VP of sales, I always felt that it was important to have some empathy when you were terminating someone because they had a family that was dependent upon him or her. Yeah. But I quickly learned as a young manager, when I was making all those mistakes that I try to help my leaders avoid making now as it relates to executive coaching. And I know you're doing the same. And I can recall a situation when I worked at MCI, someone wanted to flip over my desk because I was terminating them based on bad performance. But what I realized that I didn't do a great enough job of doing what you touched on a few minutes ago, making sure they always knew where they stood. And yes. I found that if they were surprised that they were being terminated or did not walk themselves out knowing yeah. that they were about to be terminated, I didn't do my job as a leader as far as communicating to them on a consistent basis where they stood. And one of the things that I think a lot of managers and leaders have difficulty 
doing or embracing is having those difficult conversations. Yes. You talk, you touched on conflict resolution. When you're engaging your clients, does that come up often where you may find that they may have leaders who are very experienced and tenured who are a little apprehensive to have those tough conversations? That's probably the number one issue and gap. And then time management may be number two. Okay. Um, so I got certified in crucial conversations. That helped. That is transferable skills. You can use that in a family member. It's really great. But if you just learn um, conflict management, period, mm -hmm. it's number one thing to build relationships. The, you want to make sure the person still feels safe and that um, we're communicating because we're talking about factual base. So if I know what our priorities are for the week, weekly, and I'm talking to you, then at that moment, I should be hearing from the team, what's going on and how can we support each other? And if it's just two of you, then it still should be a weekly check-in and say, what's your priorities for the week? And keeping that visible. So I always tell people and I'm like, okay, so they know that I may write it on a piece of paper, but then that goes away. This is where the management come in because I keep my stuff visible. I don't care if you put on a sales spreadsheet, a Word document, pull it up all the time because it's training them to say, this is what's the priorities. And then we veer off. Then the communication should be what's happened, you know, and we're talking about what happened and why things shifted in a different way. Um, when we get to conflict, I always talk about lead with facts. They want to go in and just say, I feel or why did you do this? Or, you know, something like that, but no one can argue facts. So help me understand. I expected you to turn in your time card at 5 p.m. And we talked about this before, but it keeps keep turning in on Monday at 3 p.m. Help me understand what happened. You know, leading always a conversation with facts and engaging the person to at least give the point of view before you hold them accountable. We don't, we just go straight in and say, you did something wrong and this is what you need to do. And it's not fixed because the person may not be accountable. They may not. They may have a real great excuse. You didn't listen. Right. <laughs> the tools and resources are slow. You, you know, like my Zoom keeps shutting down. You know, anything like that. You don't know. We need to know. Help me understand. Right. You want to pull them in and feel safe and have those conversations. That is awesome. In creating that safe space for employees mm -hmm. to be open and authentic about what they're dealing with, what are some of the ways in which... I know how leaders can do it, mm -hmm. and you touched on a lot of that, but organizations as a whole can create an environment that mm -hmm. is safe or safer for employees to express themselves and talk about some of the issues and challenges they may be dealing with, especially post-pandemic. Um, when I talked about the organizational goals, one of some of the employees that are really killing it are making that a cultural competency and a goal. Mm -hmm. Say we're an anti-racist, anti-discriminatory organization. We um, believe in the mission. We believe in, you know, training our staff. And then they say, how do we measure that and embed that in the culture? Mm -hmm. So they have the maybe some value statements that they always bring up during um, each meeting. And that must be through all the organization. They, and they carve out time for employees to talk about culture. They also embed the DEI and talk about ways of how to make sure that we're cognizant, you know, just cognizant of our differences. That matters. So if I have a, um, a um, generational gap or um, you're dealing with someone who may identify as non-binary, if we're talking about that and embedding that and say, how do we ensure our culture really magnify or, you know, exemplify what we said we're here to do and say, then you can do your survey to say, are we doing that? Do you find after these meetings, do you feel safe to talk about X, Y, and Z? Um, do we celebrate you enough? Um, do If somebody have dietary issues, do we say, okay, pay attention of what we're ordering? And if people have allergies, you'll be surprised. Do we have a culture where if we have the opportunity where people can bring their children in, to work. So whatever that organizational culture needs to exhibit, make sure that's a goal, a priority that's a, that is embedded in the DNA every day, not just a checklist, and how we're doing that. And the leaders need to be taught that, to say embed that. Because if you don't, 
and just say, this is what we, who we are. And you put an employee handbook mm -hmm. and say, if I do an onboarding and I'm really great at telling, talking about the culture, but once I get in that day-to-day -day operation, the leader doesn't, ex you know, exhibit those behaviors that we talked about. It's a disconnect. So it have to be integrated from the top. Because if it's not, <laughs> it's <laughs> null and void. <laughs> you already know that. It got to start from the top. Yes, indeed. And as an entrepreneur, business owner, I understand the importance of knowing what I know and yep. what I don't know. And one of the things that I think is truly important for business owners, whether you're a business owner of a small business, emerging business, or a large organization is understand the importance of having an HR structure, infrastructure. And if you don't, outsourcing that to an organization like yours, Manito, because for me, when I was a sales leader, it was mission critical that I put in place tools and processes to make sure that my employees were being paid. That was first and foremost. Are they being paid appropriately? Commissions, they were sales professionals and there were always commission issues that I was chasing down. Yeah. Are they provided the resources that the organization has available to them? Are they aware of the resources? And I find that especially after the pandemic, where we have a hybrid work environment, some employees working in the office, some working remote, that there's a lack of communication. And understandably so, a lot of organizations are very challenged. And there are employees out there, especially the remote employees for some of these organizations, even Fortune 1000 companies, that aren't even aware of some of the resources that are available to them. You know, for example, if someone's dealing with depression or a situation that's preventing them from being productive, what do you do or how would you encourage organizations to make sure that they're communicating effectively and that their employee population understands all of the resources that they have available to them? Ask the people. We don't talk enough. We assume a lot, especially when we're working at the top. We think we know, but you really don't know. This is why the frequent conversations are critical. Mm -hmm. And um, putting out a survey to say, do you have the tools and resources you need? Have you been trained? How frequently do you talk to your manager or leader? Do you feel supported or heard? Um, Gallup Strength Finder have Gallup Q12 questions. Some people design questions to say, what are those critical questions that support the mission that you talked about? And that becomes an organizational goal. Like how do we measure to ensure we're doing better? Because if I get data, we got the raw data and we find out, hey, um, a lot of people feel like they don't have the tools and resources. We have 100 people and 60% of them feel like they don't, that's a problem. So then we're putting in real actionable steps to say, what do we need to do? What type of tools and resources? Are they documented? So if, if, if it's about mental health, do we need to create health and wellness um, um, strategies to embed so people feel like, okay, do we have breakout rooms? Do they have a tools and resource they can contact somebody? Do they have um, somebody that they, they can talk to within the organization. So real strategies to say, we are moving the needle. We heard you and we're pulling employees in using their voices to say, what do you believe what that look like? We can't use everything. A lot of people use SWOT analysis, you know, this or um, using that data to say, we're going to try three things and try to get really great and see how it works. You know, employees like, here's a hundred things, do it all. But if, even if we're just listening, do a, um, a survey, a pulse survey, take out three or four priorities, try it, embed it. You'll find that people feel valued and heard because you really are listening. And then you have a sustainable culture. I'm going to do the pause there and cut off my 5.30 alarm. <laughs> I did but, not hear the alarm, but that's great. <laughs> but that is, you know, and I said, all right, it may not record, so I'm not going, I'm going to play it off like I don't hear it. Yeah, put it on mute. <laughs> yeah, you did real great. I did not hear it. Thank you. <laughs> so, so now what we'll do? I'll edit that piece out, but that's why I didn't say anything, even though I could hear. It. And we'll end by I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'll ask how people can get in contact with you, and I'll edit everything else out. So, Benito, you're a successful entrepreneur. You're a woman. I am a girl dad. So for me, I am very passionate about helping 
women be more successful in creating a level playing field. For you as an entrepreneur and a woman, what are some of the resources that you've been able to tap into that other entrepreneurial women can tap into to help them progress within the entrepreneurial world? Yeah, I'm so, thank you, number one. We need more uh, men to have those dialogues and acknowledge that. Like, there you go, the self-awareness. Um, because we do struggle to feel like, are we, you know, being taken seriously? I'm um, being a black woman, you know, but it also work in our favor too, because there are grants, you know, and dollars or or um ways to get involved because you are a small business owner, because you are a black owned business owner, because you're a woman um, owned business owner. So tap into those opportunities and grants because it's allowing, you know, bridging that gap of diversity to say, are we allowing access to minorities, women owned, uh, people of color, tap into those access. So you can go online and just Google, say, hey, how do I become a part of the women owned business organization? You'll be surprised how a lot of employers want to support small businesses or people of color or women owned businesses. Those are critical resources to take advantage of. I love it because so many business owners are not aware of the tools and the resources that are available for them as it relates to health insurance. Yeah. The Diversity Supplier Council, and I may have butchered that name, but different organizations that they can be a part of that yes. will not only provide them with tools and resources, but even discount on various services, right? Right. So I believe you have, this is uh, federal. You can go to score.org. You can go to the Small Business Association. Uh, I went on there and they would say, what do you need help with? You need help with marketing, your finances. Um, do you need help with IT? There are so many resources. We just don't know where to start. And that's what people say. Well, how do I get started? I went to the Small Business Association. They have one tailored for each state. and They have one at, well, at a large and they'll say, what you know, location are you in? They give you a checklist of things to help you get started. Um, so that's what I would say, navigate. And of course, if you need HR, work with all small and mid-sized businesses. You notice I didn't say large because they have access. They have the money. They got the bells and whistles. I really want to be an advocate for those who say, okay, how do I get started? Even having a conversation, you know, just to say, here's my recommendation. You don't even have to sign up. That is awesome. And on that note, first of all, you've been a wonderful guest. I am hopeful that you will come back and join me and continue to educate and drop these gems that you've dropped on this podcast episode. How can my audience get in touch with you? Yes, and I'm going to spell it, but you can go to Minito, and it's M-I-N-I-T-O, H-R Solutions with the S dot com. That's my website. You get access to my email. We have a little pop-up box that's go to my email as well to say, how can I help you? Or you can contact me at 313-801-1830. And can you give me that number again? Because I want to make sure they heard it because they need to contact you because there are so many organizations out there dropping the ball, unfortunately. Yes, thank you. It's 313-801-1830. Thank you so much for doing the great work that you're doing, giving us the platform to be able to talk about these pain points. So kudos to you. Manito, I, I appreciate you as well. The way we were introduced was from my longstanding friend, Hillary, who I've known since the early 1990s, and what Hillary said to me, I think is what she said to you as well, that we needed to connect because we were so similar in many ways. And I think she was right on point. But that even goes to a point that I stress with clients and even friends and family members, the importance of making sure that you maintain and develop those relationships. Because we all, as entrepreneurs or business professionals, or whether you're white collar, blue collar, know so many people that can help us in our professional career, whether it's finding jobs, networking for various opportunities. And here we are today as a yeah. result of Hillary yes. putting us together just three, four weeks ago. Yes. So shout out to Hillary. Like yes. I said, that that's critical. That just goes to show how relationships work because she speaks, talks about you highly. And I'm like, I could see it because that just shows that's, that's your self-awareness. That's genuine. And I was, I didn't feel like that's not true. It's totally not, you know, being fake. This is who you are. So relationships are critical. 
<laughs> so everything you just said, that's why I'm so grateful that you had the platform, grateful just bringing her name up, you know, just being mindful of that. Those are kind of things that people look for. Those, you know, people want genuine connections. Those people want to feel like you really understand my pain points. You really care about me as the person, what I'm going through. Don't just push products. And right. that's what I used to hate too. So I'm, that's why I'm like, I feel you. That's not who I am. I support you. And even with Hillary not connected, she like, you got to talk to him. He is so great. He's so down to earth, but he bought his business. That's what you want. Exactly. You want both. You want the best of both worlds. And with that being said, Manito, because you've been so awesome, you have to come back now. You have to I come hope back. you have me back. <laughs> what is the one piece of advice you would give to, and again, because I'm a girl dad, that young woman who is looking at potentially leaving corporate America and starting her entrepreneurial endeavor that could help that person avoid some of the mistakes that we probably made when we started our businesses? What's going to help you get through everything in life? What is your legacy footprint? What is your legacy footprint? Because you are going to get challenged and you need to, because that's how we grow. Um, it's two things that are going to happen in life. You're going to grow or you're going to heal. But if you focus on your legacy footprint, no matter what, you're going to keep going. If I'm an advocate, I'm an advocate. I'm an advocate off camera. I'm an advocate on camera. I'm an advocate in business. I'm an advocate with my family. That doesn't go away. That's my legacy. So remembering that, and no matter what comes against you, you're going to remember, why am I doing this? Because I'm going to stick into it. I'm going to keep grinding. I'm going to get tired, but I'm going to keep getting up. I'm going to do anything, whatever it takes, because this is the legacy I want to bring keep behind. Add value and impact to every company or every person you meet. Change the world. Manito, that was so well said. And I just want to thank our audience for watching on YouTube or listening on one of their preferred apps, as I mentioned previously. I need everyone to do me a favor, reach out to Benito, whether it be her website that she mentioned or she's on LinkedIn and give me that website again because I need to make sure people write it down. Thank you, Benito HR Solutions and that's M-I-N-I-T-O HR Solutions with an S dot com. Awesome. And prior to going to Manito's website, hit like, share, and subscribe to my podcast because Manito's coming back. And you guys are going to need to get some of her gems to make sure that you're successful, but more importantly, that you're in compliance and you're providing a, an environment that's conducive to success to your employees so that they can get to where you're at within your career and be as successful as you would like for them to be. Manito, again, thank you for coming today. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you. You have a great evening. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.